let's talk about the high note and romantic comedies. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I am pleased today to be joined by Nisha Ganatra. She is the director of The High Note, which is everywhere now. It's everywhere. You can see it everywhere. Um, uh, your iTunes, uh, your On Demand. Um, it's it's a fantastic romantic comedy, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about it. Uh, Nisha, Thank welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on Film Threat. This is awesome. <laughs> well, I'm excited because I feel like we really live in cynical times, right? Yeah. And a big romantic comedy to break out is, I feel like, much needed relief from just everything that's happening in the world. Um, you've, in a way, this is a very different kind of romantic comedy, I think. it While it has many of the tropes that we associate with romantic comedies, it's also very different. It's set in the world of music. This young girl, Maggie, played by Dakota Johnson, is the personal assistant to, uh, to well, basically, um, it's uh, Grace Davis is played by Tracy Ellis Ross, Diana Ross's daughter. Yeah. That's great. So how That's did you... There. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how did you pull together this great cast? And Grace Davis just seems so real as a character. Thank you. That's that's huge. I think, you know, we've all seen these amazing movies with uh, the Nightmare Boss and the Put Upon Assistant. So it was really tricky to not just be another one of those movies. And I wanted to make sure we had Grace Davis be a, um, a nuanced uh, music icon. And who other than Trace Ellis Ross to bring that to life? Because she really knew this story from a firsthand experience. Um, and she really like brought these layers and groundedness and a wholeness to Grace Davis that I think would have been missing in the hands of another actor. Um, but, you know, it was really fun because that, that relationship with the diva and her assistant, I think to me, it was interesting about um, the intimacy between um, a, a huge celebrity and their personal assistant, because it seems like the, the more famous you get, the smaller your world gets in a weird way. Um, it gets very isolated and very lonely. And so this assistant is often like the only person allowed into the circle. And I really wanted to explore those places where it's like they're friends, but they're not friends. And they have this intimacy of a friendship, but then it blows up in their face and um, kind of their their relationship, how they can support each other and be each other's allies um, in moments that are the most important. Well, it's interesting because there's so many layers to the to the story. I mean, that's just it's not just Maggie's story. There are okay. yeah, yeah, way, yeah, but there's that was, that was um, a big thing. We we're like, we can't have a white savior movie that's not going to fly. <laughs> so. <laughs> but but it, but it really you balance all those elements so well. In addition to, I have to ask you about Grace Davis. Just seems like so well-rounded and just real from the, there's a montage at the beginning where you kind of get a little taste of her career mm -hmm. and it just, and, and then the music is amazing. So oh, how did you. all, how did all that come together with, with the, the music and, and whatnot? Because it seems like the, the music that's in the film could just spin off and, and, and be a hit unto itself, like outside of the film. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the goal, I think, because I, read this beautiful script that Flora Greeson wrote and it had all these amazing references to most of the needle drop music that's in there. I mean, the source songs are, I'd say in large part, maybe 95% from the script because Flora had a real love for music. So then my job and Ali Lowy, our producer, the two of us had to figure out what is the sound of Grace Davis? What is David's sound? What is Maggie's sound as a producer? And how to get music and songs that complement the incredible needle drop. I mean, we have Donny Hathaway and Aretha Franklin and um, how are you gonna share, you know, like have original music that sounds like it could be on the radio, it should be on the radio, otherwise these artists aren't as good as we want them to be. And um, how to do that with music that doesn't then compete with what's in there and make it sound like wallpaper. So um, that that was a really fun and incredible task. and. Also a huge learning curve for me because it's my first big music driven movie. So I had to really figure out um, how to uh, basically produce an album and songs at the same time I was prepping a movie. And that uh, was extremely exhausting, although very satisfying and gratifying experience. 
Well, I do want to have, I'm so glad you brought that up, the um, music producing aspect. Maggie has aspirations to be a music producer. Um, you know, she's expressed her dream. And you shot at the Capitol uh, I, I recognize the Capitol Records building in the movie, which is okay. which is amazing. Those hallways. Um, I mean, there's so much music history there. It's really incredible. Tell me what it was like to shoot at that, you know, the Capitol Records building, and then also just the the nuances of learning about. I mean, I, I didn't know anything about music producing. Um, it really is a whole different thing where you know you have to have an ear for that um those scenes just rang so true i felt like i, I learned quite a bit um tell me about that thank you that yeah i love los angeles and the music industry here and the music scene here i think it's one of those cities that gets overlooked as such a a hub of real um music breaking through and of, of new music breaking through and I love the Capitol Records building. We drive by it like all the time. We're on the 101. And just sometimes, you know, the, I know you, you love this building, the, the, the way the sun catches it and the light catches it. And you have that moment where you just realize that's Capitol Records and what's happened there and the history that's happened there. So when we were uh, given permission to film there, it just, the whole crew, all of us walked in so giddy. And while we were filming those scenes in those hallways, you realize the history, what's, what's you know, been made there and the, icons and legends that have performed there and recorded there, it just um, gave us all such a sense of um, pride in our industry and our art and also just reverence for all that's come before us. And, um, you know, it was really fun to film like the the city. Uh, I'm so happy I didn't have to try to make Atlanta look like Los Angeles, <laughs> but it was, you know, we could go to the Silver Lake Lounge, we could go to, um, you know, Los Globos, we could go to Echoplex, we could, go to these awesome places to hear all the coolest bands. And uh, we, we even brought back um, Spaceland and the curtain that I, I miss so much because now Spaceland is no more. But um, it was just a really fun movie to make in that we could show all the things I love about Los Angeles that you don't get to see so much, you know? Like everybody hikes through this mountain that is in the middle of our city and yet you would never know it from watching LA in movies. It's mostly like just palm trees and the Beverly Hills sign. So, um, it was fun to really like dive into the music scene here. Well, I mean, in a sense, LA is like a character in the film and I'm so glad you brought up Spaceland. Uh, that was so, <laughs> that's so awesome. Um, Ice Cube, I, I just want to just, um, selfishly ask a question about working with Ice Cube. He's so awesome in this role. Was this something of a parody of maybe people that he encountered in the, in the music business? That I'm in so glad you got that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I just, I want to hear about that. And he is just, I mean, he's kind of annoying, but charming, right? Oh my God. So. Well, first, you know, you, you, it sounds like idolized Ice Cube as much as I did and still do. And then he came on to play this part. I remember meeting with him about this part. And he just sort of, you know, he was like, oh, yeah, I know a few guys like this. And I was like, OK, here it comes. Ice Cube is going to put his 30 years in the music industry behind uh, creating this, like, very, as he says, shady ass manager that I know is an amalgamation of many people he's come into contact with. But he is also just a comedic gold. Like, he is a brilliant improviser. And the things he made up and the way he would just be open and roll, you know, like I, at one point I was like, you know what, Cube, I think it'd be really funny if your character just um, was trying to give up sugar and just trying not to eat sweets and everything. And so he's like, all right. And I just give him a piece of cake and just roll, you know, and he would uh, make up the most fun lines. Like there's a part where he takes a, a red vine out of Tracy's hand and bites it and says 20% of that's mine. And that's just Cube making up like, the hilarious one-liners everywhere he goes so he had us all just dying all the time there's there's stuff he could bring to it because he is a musician and he knows this industry so well that i think we never would have gotten if it wasn't him yeah i mean he's he's so awesome that the red vine scene is is amazing yeah. uh it's uh it was there's another scene too that i think really speaks to the um some of the themes in, in the film which is uh where grace davis has the meeting with all the executives yeah. and um, she kind of, she, she, she maybe knows herself in a way, but, but is having some realization about where her career is at. Um, uh, Maggie doesn't necessarily agree with her, which I think is great. Um, tell me about that scene. I thought that that scene was, 
was really, really amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is that is the the probably arguably the most important scene in the movie. It's it's such a pivotal scene. It's two women, you know, both Maggie's character and Grace's character are at a point in their careers where they have to decide if they're going to take the safe road or if they're going to take a risk and reach for something bigger. And you know, I'm all for any movie that encourages women to take risks and then rewards them for taking that risk. I think that there's so many movies that really punish women for taking risks. And um, in that scene, she is, Grace Davis, Trace Ellis Ross is alone. Basically, she's the only woman of color in this room. She's got a, a you know, all male record executives telling her what she should do. Her ally is Ice Cube, but he kind of folds and tells her to listen to the guys too. And the only person in the room who thinks she shouldn't have folded when she, you know, makes a decision to listen to their advice is Maggie. And so there's a scene in the bathroom after where it really is just such a beautiful scene because um, Tracy, her character is just so tired, you know, and you can tell it's just been years of compromise and biting your tongue. And she says the statistic that we were all shocked to learn, which is that in the history of music, only five women over the age of 40 have had a number one hit and only one of them was black. And that's an absolutely true statistic. And it kind of says without saying it, you know, that Maggie and her sort of young and white privilege can come in and just say, no, you shouldn't do these things. You should just do what you want. And uh, not accepting the reality of the world and the stats and how things work, you know, but, um, but both of them are in that moment cheerleading each other as they're even um, telling each other, you don't know my story and you don't know how it goes, you know? Um, and because it's a comedy, of course, it never gets as heavy as I just described. But that to me is really what's going on underneath that whole scene. Well, I think it, I think it makes, um, you know, this romantic comedy just have much more weight to it. Yeah. Um, I think that um, just Hollywood in the last decade, uh, romantic comedies are not as, you know, they're not as prevalent in terms of the, that genre. I like the reinventions. Crazy Rich Asians, I thought was amazing. Yeah. You know, a, a, a sort of f a flip on the traditional romantic comedy. I, I, I think I think this as well. And something that I, I find interesting that we're not talking about is the fact that the, at the center is also um, an interracial relationship. I mean, um, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, also, How it's cool like that we're not even talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's not to me. It's not the thing that stands out. There's so many other aspects. I mean, I'd like to talk about her car. You know, she drives that <laughs> that old Nova, right? Oh it's a cool. Yeah. Old muscle car. You don't see yeah. you don't see that very often. But um, what I like is like, hey, I, at some point, we're just going to get to the point where it's not even mentioned because because who cares? And I and yeah. I feel like the movie handles it in such a well way as to not ignore race, but also to not comment on it constantly. It's just it's there. It's recognized, um, and it's and it's handled in just in in just exactly the right way. Um, that just yeah. I mean, you're just attracted to those characters. You want to see them win. Yeah, I think that's the that's the fine line to walk, right? We can't say color and race doesn't exist because that's not true and that's bananas. But we also don't want to constantly be didactic and be like well because of this and because of that you know so i think you're right the key is just diving into the characters and empathy and caring about them and their journeys and that way um it kind of transcends everything else in there nisha ganatra thank you so much for talking to us on the film threat podcast uh congratulations on the film it's um i i thought it was amazing it's so fun it's a breath of fresh air it's something we need right now and uh mm. and, and so congratulations thank you i hope it does make everyone feel better we made this movie for everyone to feel hopeful and happy when they walk out so hopefully no one's walking out of their own homes now but hopefully it'll still give you that that uplifting feeling you can dance around your living room well uh, <laughs> i i just have one advice for anyone watching it crank up the sound yes it's, the music track is so good in the film yeah uh, we had incredible mixers and they're like the best uh, post sound people. So please, 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 if you're going to watch it on a, a iPad or a computer, which is a little bit of a bummer, but please at least put on headphones so you hear their incredible work. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Nisha. Thanks for talking Thank to us. Thank you. Thank you so much.